Hello everyone, welcome to Piano Well. Um, I'm gonna talk today a little bit with a very soft voice because um, I have to take care of my voice. I have some problems with coughing and I'll try my best not to interrupt this beautiful tutorial with it. So, but still, it's gonna be fun. So, as usually, I wanna present you guys how uh, certain musical means of expression from Piano Well system helps to achieve uh, some fundamental and very important things in this etude. So, uh, we're going to talk about three things. Firstly, how to achieve legato in octaves, because it's still Chopin and uh, we still need to play it somehow in a cantabile way. Second, how to achieve accuracy and security while playing fast octaves. And lastly, how to um, control freedom in hands without, without any unnecessary tension while playing this etude. Okay guys, let's start with legato thing. As, um, if you follow my system, you probably know what are the requirements that we need to achieve legato. Uh, it's about how we imagine vertical line and how we sing horizontal line between notes. So how do we imagine vertical line is every single note, even if it's four parts here, we have to imagine all together in a certain timbre, could be violins or cellos, depending on the register on your keyboard. And uh, we have to imagine with not only note in the violins, but also in the movement and that would be according to the melody pattern and this is also applied to octaves even though you may say I mean how can I move my uh, how can I move my wrist while playing octave because when we're gonna play we're gonna move our wrist the same way as we imagine it but I just want to show you guys that you still try even though your hands might be uh, a little bit more tiny than tiny than mine, but still, see what when I play, I'm still moving my wrist to the right, and you gotta make it with absolutely relaxed hands, and if you have clear fingertips, that will help a lot. Eventually, when you play faster, your wrist will become stiff and rigid. So this is about vertical line. Now, horizontal line is how we actually sing between notes, and um, this is absolutely crucial for legato. Um, so we're gonna sing between notes with glissando and resistance. Mm. Let's say. You would move resistance like you would move your hand in the water. I should have sang with resistance, but why is okay? <coughs> and <coughs> it's a little bit harder to do in this etude because most of the time Chopin uses semitones, like seconds, major minor seconds, as a as a step and God knows this is so hard to feel in this short distance, this descent and resistance. But you still gotta make it. So even though I wouldn't just that's not legato singing. I would sing and if you could make this space between notes that you feel it through your singing, then later on you're going to express this is your space, this is your creation space where you express everything 
about this etude, whether it's emotional image or phrasing or form of the piece, whatever you want to say, but you're going to express it exactly in this distance, in this space between, in between notes. Uh, so, let's see, I just want to play and let's see the difference between playing without intonation and with intonation. So without intonation it would be quite flat and you can feel it. about intonation here. Uh, let's just, just a little bit talk about accents. So this fartando, uh, these are different things. <laughs> I told about this already before in my tutorials about Itches by Chopin. Um, whatever he wants to really make accent or marcata, he would try this fartando style. But these little hairpins, I don't know, like so-called also accent, Sometimes he didn't really mean that they need to be really articulated this way. Sometimes he just want to tell, pay attention, maybe voice those notes. But um, you don't have to uh, really... Um, because that will guys break the line and that's not what he wanted. Um, so, the way we intonate sforzando, real accents that he meant, is again through intonation when we um, when we sing the first part with resistance and then we accelerate with weight towards uh, next note. So, uh, if you could hear from my playing, those sforzando were very, very, very um, expressive and I could really feel it. Simply because I feel it. <laughs> so if I intonate this one, I would intonate it this way. And this gives so much character to music, guys. That helps a lot to feel how deep this pain is. Like it's deep deep and just like come out, come out, come out and, and just overflow eventually to this B minor. <laughs> so uh, I just want to say that intonation is not only for good legato but also to to feel accents and to play them very very expressive. So this is one thing. Another thing is how to in the in the like in the middle of learning this piece I would really suggest you to voice your uh, pinky in the right hand because there should be always a melody and that somehow also helps you to create illusion of legato when in every uh, octave it's not like four parts like this So this um, cantabile, this good legato will also be guaranteed to you. It helps. Alright, enough for legato. Now let's talk about accuracy and security. Uh, these are only always <laughs> Two things that are responsible for accuracy while playing in leaps or in these octaves. So the first thing is uh, how we move our elbow. So elbow is responsible to prepare new positions and uh, the thing is that if we go to new position first we need to move our elbow to 
prepare and then we'll move the hand. If we just move the hand, we will have stiffness over here and mm, we're gonna miss everything, miss every note. In this etude, I should say that I sometimes have to change up to four times in one bar positions. Because basically it's all in octaves, like changing octave, it's already in a new position, right? Mm, but still, of course we cannot change in the, every octave, but at least every um, third octave you have to change. For example, I will change here. Generally, musical speech is about how to feel uh, distance between notes differently because we have short distance, we have big distance, and every second, third, fourth piece they have different emotional meaning. Uh, third and six could represent love and ro romance, and second and seven, um, some painful feeling. Fourth, more energetic, fifth, less energetic, it's like opposite meditation. But the thing is that um, when you do a certain exercise, like from my training program, you eventually train yourself to feel differently these intervals. Of course, you're not going to analyze this each like where is the second, where is the pain, where is the raw, beautiful and love. It's not that uh, black and white. but you will get the certain feeling in your vocal cords how you differently intonate distance between notes and because your um, vocal cords, how you intonate, directs your hands it helps you um, to be accurate in every interval you play that also helps you to play um, accurately intervals for you actually miss the notes meaning that for example yeah over here let's say i play like this okay i, I miss this note so instead of just repeating a hundred times in a stupid way i would just analyze and understand uh, which note i miss and why could be either i didn't move my elbow enough so it was quite rigid so I need to move my elbow enough but most importantly I would pay attention exactly towards this note to the interval that leads to that note which is ascending fourth and I would intonate this ascending fourth with more attention and eventually that um, that helps me to, to play the, this interval always very clear the next time I play it um, so you always have to be like a little bit like a doctor to yourself, know exactly what is going on, you know, like, and know which musical minute expression you need to help yourself to overcome any problems. And uh, actually, if we <laughs> talk about little bit of musical speech, there is so much sense in this, because, for example, second, as I said, is an intonation of pain and um, some kind of waiting, asking, 
um, it's really hard for uh, intonation. So he uses seconds here like 90%, even when he starts. <laughs> when you understand it through musical speech and sometimes he would use fours for example in the right hand and we know that the fours is energetic it's like the call to, to, to an action it's very energetic intonation so And the last thing is uh, how to play with, how to maintain, how to sustain, how to remain, I don't know which word is better, how to remain um, this freedom in hands while playing octaves. And uh, so the thing is that why our hands get stiff is because they stop breathing. It's like body, you know, when, when we stop breathing, the, when we're dead, and dead body rigid. <laughs> Man, sorry for this analogy, but this is what happened to our hands muscles. <laughs> they cannot breathe, they dead and so either you would play this etude on constant inhaling when well, even when you try and inhale all the time, it's just like uh, there's no way out. Or if you try to play it with relaxed hands, you want to play it always on exhaling, which also eventually brings it to tension in hands. So, uh, to be able to play with free hands, we need to have a healthy, good breathing, breathe out. And that means that when we breathe in, we have more tension in hands. When we breathe out, uh, muscles of hands are relaxing. But how to make our hands to breathe this way? So in this case, we're gonna use, again, like in medicine, phrasing. Because phrasing is the art of breathing. And um, what is basically happening is when we find the blocks, because as we know, phrasing consists of small blocks like motifs uh, or bigger blocks, phrases, and the bigger sentence. So in every block, we're going to have main parts uh, where we're actually leading, where we're uh, leading our melody. And that somehow creates this kind of energetic crescendo, energetic crescendo. And when we do this energetic crescendo towards, let's say, main interval in the motive, then somehow, you know, our hands are inhaling towards this. As soon as we pass this main part, we're exhaling and the muscles are relaxing. So let me show you how it works. Let's say I'm going to play this bar without motive. So, okay, let's start. One motif is one bar here. And uh, we always go through the bar line. So basically, I'm going to finish over here our first motif, and then second. Like this. And um, main interval is going to be the last interval in this motif. So, when we're going to express it through intonation, that intonation that I talked about earlier, uh, distance, through the distance between notes, then we can feel this phrase, this motive. So, let's say I play without uh, motive. It's going to be like this. Oh. 
fast tempo. So again, this small block we can unite in the bigger blocks, which is phrase. So phrase would consist of two bars, where second bar is more important, second motive is more important. So now our hands will begin to breathe on a bigger scale. So this is less. case one bar less tension second bar more tension <laughs> and um, there we're gonna unite two phrases in one sentence and we're gonna get um, four bar sentence and um, second phrase is gonna be more important so now we're gonna breathe through two bars so two bars less important two bars more important so this is, for example, less. In this case, we're gonna always maintain these beautiful waves of breathing while playing, and hands simply have no reason to get stiff because <laughs> they're always breathing. So this is the key, how to maintain freedom in hands, use phrasing. And I think I will finish with this quite enough. Um, and thanks so much for watching. See you in my next video. Bye bye.